more ancient history jewelry stories. It's Friday, which means it's time for birthstone stories. And of course, because it's April, we are still talking about diamonds. Here's the highly anticipated diamonds part three, the bad stuff. I wanna start off with the actual definition of the term blood diamond or conflict diamond. These terms have really gained some traction in pop culture in the last 20 years, but they have a more restrictive definition than most people think. Blood diamonds or conflict diamonds are classified as diamonds that are mined in a war zone and sold to finance armed conflicts against legitimate governments. You might notice that this fails to take into account some of the unethical ways that diamonds can be mined outside of these parameters, including situations where the mining is endorsed by a legitimate government. In order to try to combat this problem, the Kimberly process was created in 2003. This is a vetting and certification process that was created in order to increase transparency in the diamond supply chain. As of 2024, about 99.8% of the world's diamond rough is certified under the Kimberly process. Unfortunately, the Kimberly process is only focusing on this very rigid definition of blood and conflict diamonds. There are a lot of issues with the Kimberly process, including the fact that diamonds are not certified when they leave the mine, but when they leave the country of origin. They're also certified by batch, not by single diamond. This means that unscrupulous diamond dealers and miners can mix batches from different mines and have them all certified as being from one Kimberly certified mine. This also doesn't take into account the abysmal working conditions in mines that are not producing what's defined as blood and conflict diamonds. In my opinion, one of the most ethical ways to source diamonds is to use recycled vintage and antique diamonds. These stones have already been mined, the labor and damage have already been done, and as we'll see, reusing diamonds flies in the face of what the big diamond cartel wants you to do. That big diamond cartel of course, is none other than the De Beers Company. The history of De Beers goes back to the 1870s, when huge deposits of diamonds were found in South Africa. South Africa was still a British colony at the time, so British miners flocked to South Africa to make their fortune. Of course, they quickly realized that if there was a glut of material hitting the market, it was going to lose its value very quickly. Before this, diamonds had been a niche product for the ultra-rich. An enterprising miner got the idea to create what was essentially a cartel of diamond dealers and miners. This became the De Beers Diamond Company. The goal was to limit the supply of diamonds hitting the market in order to artificially increase the value, but they took it one step further. In 1938, they hired the NWA or Advertising Agency in an attempt to sell diamonds to a new market emerging after the end of the Great Depression in the United States. In 1940, NWA or came up with a slogan that we all know, a diamond is forever an absolutely genius slogan because it implies many things. One, that a diamond is completely indestructible, which is not the case at all. Two, that it would be a shame to resell a diamond because after all, it is forever. And three, planted the subtle idea that a marriage would only be successful if it started with the foundation of this indestructible forever stone. They initially urged men to spend two months salary on a diamond ring, which quickly became three months salary. This was the standard through most of the 20th century. And De Beers saw their US sales go from $23 million in 19 1939 to $2.1 billion by 1979. In the late 90s and early 2000s, people started scrutinizing the dark side of the diamond industry a little bit more, and there's been a real pushback. De Beers has lost the majority of its market share and no longer owns the majority of the world's rough diamonds. 